Welcome to our 19th startup uh, afternoon here in a beautiful location which you just saw, saw with a drone of the Digital Dutch Experience Center of KPN. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's been over 500 people who are interested in this event. It's uh, a themed event on AI and machine learning. Welcome to uh, all the startups here. I hope we could meet you uh, for some great speed dates this afternoon. Uh, welcome to all the corporates and investors that are joining us. Uh, we have 20 uh, of those partners uh, today present and over 150 uh, speed dates matched for you. Usually I do the program, but I think this is a special day uh, because it's the last startup afternoon where uh, Rick van Hof, my team uh, lead, is joining. And since Le Rick likes the stage and it's his last time, the stage is yours, Rick. Uh, enjoy and have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you, MJ, for the really nice and warm introduction. And of course, welcome everybody to this 19th KPN Startup Afternoon. We host this event every quarter of the year. Um, so of course, then we have to work three months to work towards this moment. So I'm really happy to finally um, be able to, uh, to have this event, to host this. And um, yeah, th thanks of course to, to all the startups. I can't see the slides. Yeah, all right. Um, so the goal of the event, we have two goals every time. So the first one is to inform and to inspire you about a certain topic. So every time there is a different topic, and this time we focus on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So during my daily job, I see a lot of companies that are mentioning that are using these techniques in their products, in their services. But it's interesting to know what it actually is and how it works. And therefore, we want to dive more into this topic today. And I'm not going to do that myself. Um, I invited some experts to help me on this topic. So today, uh, I have for you Maurits Kaptein. You will see him later on. He will give us uh, two short mini lectures about what AI actually is, how it works, and also he will explain a number of use cases. And between the sessions of Mauritz, uh, we have an interesting panel discussion for you. First, we have a colleague of mine, Chris Molanes. Um, we also have Joni Oosveen from Jets University. And also we have Turan, who will be here, uh, not physically, but virtually. But of course, I'm still very happy to have him here. Uh, and he's from Google from, uh, and focusing on Google Benelux. So the second goal of this event is to connect startups and corporates. As KPN, we really believe that open innovation is important and to help each other to innovate, to stimulate developments and to help each other to, to get forward. Um, so that's why we've invited a lot of corporates, and you can see an overview of all the companies that are joining here today. Uh, so many thanks to you, to the ones that we already welcomed for a number of times during our last events, but also, of course, to the corporates that are joining for the first time. Um, so we're really happy to have you all over here. And of course, the corporates and the investors are not the only ones who are, be, who are joining us today. Because there's quite a lot of people. Uh, we have the highest numbers of participants, so I'm really glad to share you some insights about that. We have over 535 participants. Um, from our KPN colleagues, we can welcome them from 12 different departments. Uh, from the corporates and investors, we have 20 different companies. And from the startups and scale-ups, we have over 270 participants which result all in over 150 speed dates, which will happen in the second part of this event. And of course, a year ago, um, we all had to move online. And of course, our event also, we used to do this physically, but we have to move towards an online setting. And it, we improved a lot. And I'm therefore really proud to say that we, did, that we host this event today live from our Digital Dutch Experience Center, which is an event location of KPN where we can meet with uh, our, our, our customers to work on new innovations. And we not only organize this event ourselves with just the liaison management team, 
We did this in collaborations also with the KPN Ventures team. So I want to explain a bit more um, about the differences between this team or these teams. With the KPN Liaison Management, we really focus on uh, looking for new collaborations. Uh, so the goal is to collaborate, where the goal of KPN Ventures is to invest in companies to help them scale their products and their services. So if you have any interest to work together with us, with either our liaison management team, you can uh, contact us via kpnscaleups at kpn.com. If you're interested to talk to my colleagues from the ventures departments, please feel free to send a message to kpnventures at kpn.com. All right, so what I mentioned is that the goal of this event, of course, is to connect. And we've created many, or many speed dates, but um, we are limited in the amount of speed dates that we, that we can create. So therefore, we also introduce a new way for you to communicate, to connect with others. Because during the speed dates, we also will open up online networking rooms. And just like physical events from a year ago, you can connect with new people, share your opinions, share your experiences, and of course, um, enlarge your network. I will explain a bit more about how this works later on during this plenary part. And connecting doesn't stop after six o'clock when the speed dates are finished because um, we invite you all to also use the Swapcard app, which is a networking app. Uh, for the ones who have um, signed up for this, you should have received an email earlier this week. Haven't you signed up? Please go to the website, create your account, and scroll through the participants to connect with other people. And to wrap up this introduction, because um, we have a lot of other stuff planned for you, I want to go through the schedule so you can see what to expect. So for the upcoming hour, we will divide this in four blocks of 10 minutes. Two blocks, um, we will have Maudis Kaptein, who will explain us more about artificial intelligence and the use cases. And um, in between, we will have this, the, the panel discussion with Chris, Joni, and Turan. At the end, we will do a short closing, and the, then also we have a break for you, uh, so you can prepare yourselves for the speed dates. And then from four, uh, four o'clock and onwards, you have two hours to connect and to speak to each other during five rounds of speed dates. So then let's move to the first part. Uh, I would like to introduce Maurits Kaptein. He is professor data science at Tilburg University and also at Jets University. Uh, he also is co-founder of a startup, Scalable, uh, which focuses on deployment on AI models. And let's not forget, he also wrote his own book, um, Hallo Wereld, in Dutch. Uh, so please feel free, if you're interested after seeing his talk, uh, to look for his book online uh, to get more information and uh, find out about the basics of artificial intelligence and IT in general. So, Maurits, I would like to give the floor to you for the first mini lecture. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, thanks for the, the warm welcome and a, and a nice introduction. Um, so today I have the honor to kind of introduce you a bit to this tricky topic of artificial intelligence. And despite the fact that I have worked for the past decade on what I would call artificial intelligence and machine learning applications, it is always tricky to truly define what AI is and how it can be used. But I'm going to try to give you some background and some ways of thinking about what this topic actually tries to do and what it can mean for you. Um, so I'm going to try to answer this question, what is AI? And just starting off with that question, I think we all have some idea of what AI might be through all of its applications that we have seen in the last few years. So we've seen very diverse applications of, in a sense, computers doing smart things, which is what I would kind of broadly define as being AI. So think about a few of these applications. For example, we now have devices that, that measure movements of, of cows, for example, and would classify automatically whether they're eating or sleeping or running. And those are applications of AI, potentially on the device that's actually measuring the movements of these cows. Um, 
But on a very different field, we also have AI summarizing large pieces of text, so automatically creating smaller summaries of complex text. And back to a very different application, we have AI, for example, on drones in the lower left of this slide, flying around uh, warehouses and actually counting the number of objects on the shelves, which used to be kind of a tricky and labor-intensive process. Um, and kind of closer to home, maybe to some of the applications for KPN, we obviously have AI being used on the web to create personalized experiences, to recommend fitting products. And all of these examples, as kind of broad as they are, are all examples of the use of AI. So what ties these extremely diverse fields together? And I would say, if you take one step back and kind of look at this slightly more abstractly, you'd see that there's only a few kind of abstract methods that are actually being used to enable all of these applications. So despite the fact that the applications differ wildly, we only have a few ways in which we actually teach computers to do smart things. So here's just a, a short list of what I would say is a pretty complete list, actually, of the ways in which we have taught computers to learn things. And I'm just going to mention these and then dig into one of them. So there's four ways in which we, at this moment in time, teach computers things, so to say. So, so the AI can actually be built. Um, one is what we're calling supervised learning. Supervised learning means that a computer is able to learn from examples, so to tie input to output. Example, have a picture of a cat, a computer recognizing that's a cat. As long as I have pictures and labels, whether there's a cat on these pictures, a computer can tie these two together. That's what's called supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is the simple art of summarizing data. So finding patterns that are in some ways lower dimensional representations of large sets of data, how do we summarize them nicely? Reinforcement learning is this idea that we can actively, interactively learn. So we can have computers interact, play chess against each other, for example, to learn more and more. And finally, and this is, I think, more recent, we have a class of models that's what's called generative models. So we are now able to have computers generate their own images. And if you look at these, these might seem kind of very distant or distinct, but actually the core of all of these is this idea of supervised learning. Because in some ways, reinforcement learning is just supervised learning with interaction with the environment. Generative models is just supervised learning flipped upside down. So what I think is really important if you want to understand the essentials of AI is understanding how this supervised learning actually works. And not necessarily how it works in specific applications. We'll get back to applications in the panel discussion, and in my second talk I'll talk about a few applications. But somewhat more abstractly, how does this supervised learning work? So how does a computer tie input to output? How does a computer learn these types of relationships? So let's start with this fairly abstractly, admittedly. So this might be a bit intimidating, and I'm sorry, but we'll, we'll talk you through all the details. So what is actually happening in supervised learning is that we have this situation where we have loads and loads, often, of data, where these data consist of what is called feature vectors and outcomes or labels. They consist of input and output. So for example, loads of pictures of cats and the labels whether or not there is a cat on these pictures. But the inputs and outputs can be very different. So it might also just be whatever is the sensor at the neck of the cow is measuring and the label as to whether or not it's eating or sleeping or running. So we have examples, input, and the desired output. On top of that, we have what's called a model class. So a lot of different ways of trying to... So a model class would be a set of hypotheses that tries to match the input to the output. This is quite abstract, but we'll see an example in a second. And we have an error function. What is an error function? That's just a mathematical function that tells us how well we're doing. So is our match between input and output reasonable? The only thing that computers do in supervised learning is to try to find the set of rules, the, the hypothesis that matches input to output as good as possible. Let me give an example, because this was fairly abstract. A simple example would be the following. Suppose we have data, input and output pairs, where the data consists of the latitude and altitude of different cities. So here I have eight cities with different latitude and altitudes, and the label, so the outcome that I would like to predict is whether or not it snows in these cities in winter. 
Now, my model class could be all the potential trees, is what we call them, all the potential simple rules that tell you, for example, if the altitude is higher than this or if the latitude is higher than that. And let's, let's focus on simple rules that are only three levels deep. So there's only three of these rules. And let's further define this error function saying that we incur some cost if we make a mistake, whereas if we don't make a mistake, we incur zero cost. So this is the setup, and now we can try different hypotheses from all the possible trees that we can generate. So let's just try one of them and see how we actually fare. And in red, kind of in the table, you'll see how this model performs. This is just saying, oh, if the latitude is below 50, does it snow, yes or no? And you'd see that this is quite okay, but there's two cities for which this specific hypothesis out of this much larger set of all the possible trees actually works. Let's try another one. If I try this specific hypothesis, so now I have the latitude and the altitude, you'd find that I would actually have the correct prediction for each and every city. And this highlights that we can do something that kind of looks as follows if we look intimidatingly at code. We can go and instruct a computer to, from this set of all potential trees, pick one, maybe even pick one randomly, compute the error on this training data that we have. If it performs well, we'll keep it. If it performs poorly, we'll try another hypothesis. And if we have loads and loads of data and a very fast computer to generate these new hypotheses over and over again, we will eventually find some set of rules that provides a reasonable mapping between the input and output. And despite the fact that this if you're looking at these trees, it seems extremely simple. If your set of hypotheses is large enough and the number of input and output examples that you have is large enough, through this extremely simple algorithm, at least in theory simple algorithm, computers can learn amazing things. So how do we teach computers to summarize text? Precisely through this method. How do we teach computers to link or to identify where there's a cat in an image? precisely to, through this method. How do we teach computers whether on some video image of a drone that's flying past a warehouse, how many, how many products there are on stock? Precisely through this method. So this extremely simple idea is given enough data and given extremely fast computers that can try all of these potential hypotheses, because there might be hundreds, millions of potential hypotheses, we can have computers learn these types of relationships. And what I think is useful to take away at this point is the fact that all of these fancy names that you might have seen pop up, so deep learning, deep neural networks, linear models, regression trees, all of these names of different types of AI methods are just different sets of hypotheses and different error functions. They're all this exact same algorithm. And second, once you know this idea, you also know that there might be quite a large distinction between training a computer to recognize things, where you need loads and loads of data and very fast computers, and in some ways actually using some of the outputs of this training. Because after a computer has learned the trick, really all you need are the specific hypotheses that tell you, given an image, is there a catch, yes or no. So what I've hoped to have explained is how all of these kind of different fields of machine learning tie together, at least for supervised learning, into this super simple algorithm. And given enough data and given powerful computers, we can have them learn extremely complex relationships. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Mauritz, for explaining that for all of these different techniques, actually behind it, there's this kind of the same uh, reasoning behind it. Um, and I would like to d dive a bit more into this topic. And like I mentioned earlier, I've invited a couple of people to, um, to, come to have a conversation with. So I would like to introduce you first to Yoni. Uh, Yoni Oosveen, uh, he's, he's the director of Jats Playground. Um, so that's an incubator program of the Jats University. Welcome. Uh, Chris, you're a colleague of mine. We've been working for some time right now. Uh, you're a data scientist at our advanced analytics department. 
Um, and uh, looking to my left, uh, we also have uh, virtually uh, Turan Bumus. Um, he is our AI and ML practice lead from Google. So thank you very much as well. Um, and yeah, actually, I want to um, start, like all of you have been working for quite some years within this field. Um, I'm curious, what is, it, what is it actually that made you um, to start with this job? And what, what is it that uh, always keeps you going? Uh, maybe jo Joni, can you explain what is so, so interesting about this field? Well, <coughs> for me, it's, a, it's slightly different because I'm, I'm not like a, a technical guy um, at all. Um, after I, uh, I sold my startup in Singapore, I came back to the, uh, to the Netherlands and um, worked a bit as a, a contractor uh, left and right. And then I thought, OK, what do I want to do? And then uh, somebody uh, uh, said, hey, have a look at JADS. They're starting this incubator, um, uh, helping uh, startups, uh, students, um, with data science, AL, uh, AI, and, and uh, machine learning. And uh, I was like, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's really cool. It's really something I, I want to dive into. Um, on one hand, I like to help students with their startups. Um, and on the other hand, you know, uh, data science, AI, machine learning, uh, super cool things, super interesting. So yeah, double yummy for me. And you've been working for uh, some years now uh, at Jets, uh, helping startups. Um, did you see a shift in the last years more uh, towards, indeed, um, more products that have AI or ML functions in it? Yeah, well, I, th I think in the, um, in the beginning, and especially uh, with the student startups, you, uh, uh, I think five, seven years ago, you saw that they were more into uh, B2C applications and services, whereas now you can see that shifting to more and more to uh, B2B services. Um, and also what I see the last few years is that a lot of startups are looking to um, solve uh, socially responsible problems, mm -hmm. uh, climate problems, uh, environmental problems. Um, I think a nice uh, example is uh, one of the current playground startups called uh, Goal3, who are, by the way, um, they will be pitching tonight in the Dragon's Den. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what they, what they do is they, they, uh, they made a little uh, device machine where, uh, with which they can monitor uh, uh, the heart rate and the breathing and the temperature of babies, which is uh, especially helpful in third world in developing countries um, to help the doctors there to uh, be very quick to see if something is, is wrong. So you really saw a shift indeed from B to B, uh, sorry, B to C to B to B, and also actually the topics that they're covering with the uh, solutions they have, they're also focusing more on these like sustainability, health exactly. issues, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Chris, I'm actually interested. Um, within KPN, you've been working there for, so, for some years. Uh, did you also see a shift? Because you're working for the business. Is there a, a change in demand in the last years? Um, at least from my perspective, what we're seeing is that the business is becoming more and more comfortable with asking us to solve more complex problems, or even higher level problems. Uh, so less on, can you predict this KPI for me, um, and I'll figure out what that means for my business, to more prescriptive problems. Problems like, um, what are the types of products that I should be launching? Um, what are the price points I should be focusing on? These are much more high level problems that typically were left to managers to decide on what they think is the best. But now they're trying to be more data driven in what direction they want to take their company in. So you do indeed see a yeah, change. So yeah, definitely a major shift from um, the Excel, try to make sure this linear regression works well to um, help me with strategy. And is that also something that always keeps you motivating to um, stay active in, in this kind of work? Yes, so at least for me, the, the challenge is I, um, I like solving complex problems. And as soon as I solve a complex problem, I like pursuing the next complex problem, or even a harder problem. Um, and there's no shortage of hard problems to solve with machine learning. So it's a field that I can see myself enjoying for at least uh, as far as I can see. And, and I'm curious, um, so with your team, of course, you made a lot of, of tools already to help the business to automate stuff. Like if you look at the level where we are right now, what kind of space of what we can do have we already covered? And what is there still to cover? So if I focus only on the telco industry, um, maybe even KPN alone, I would say probably around the 30% mark 
but what's unique about the position we're in is that we've pretty much plucked the low-hanging fruit. The, the, the simple things that, yeah, of course you can use AI to solve that, and that's, of course that will make a benefit to, to the bottom line. That's the stuff we've already covered, because we've been busy for a while and we're quite efficient at our jobs, at least we hope so. Uh, so what's left are the more complex, the, the ones where you, it requires um, explaining people why this problem could be solved in a different way, or, or why you can guarantee that a certain process will never go about out of its bounds, but still work the way you want it to. And this, uh, th this, this is essentially the, the last 70% of the possible things we could solve. So would, would you say then that uh, the best is yet to come, or? Um, and because I like complex problems, yes, <laughs> the <laughs> so best is yet to come. Sure. Because these yeah. are all these are all more complex problems than what we have tackled before. Cool. Uh, so really curious because I know the products that you, uh, like the projects that you've been working on. I'm really curious what will then indeed uh, in the upcoming years what kind of products uh, projects you then will have. Um, but I guess the, I, I will have to stay at KPM for quite a while uh, to, to see that. Um, then Turan, can you hear me well? Yes. Very much. Perfect. Uh, so I'm actually curious. Um, also, you've been working in this field, of course, for some years. Uh, can you give them some insights? What is the coolest thing uh, that you have seen that uh, AI or machine learning enabled? Well, I mean, uh, there are quite a few examples, and then especially the, the, that those examples just uh, took a, quite a peak when I first started movie uh, working. And uh, it was quite impressive, and I was thinking that there was also a public uh, article about it, is that, uh, for example, Google is right now able to uh, detect spam messages, uh, detect 100 million spam messages every day for everybody. So that's, if you think about it, that, that means like 1,000, more than 1,000 messages per second. And then they're just doing that for 365 days, 24 hours. Uh, so that requires quite a lot of computational power, quite a lot of expertise in machine learning and alike. So that was one of the, I haven't personally worked on it, but then when I first joined it, when I was just being presented uh, about what's going on in the company, that was quite impressive for me. Cool. And uh, you also mentioned like th that you need indeed a certain type of expertise for this. Um, so I'm interested if you can explain um, what is actually needed. What kind of things do you need to know? What kind of good? What are the good characteristics of a data scientist? Yeah. So I mean, throughout my career, I had the chance to be able to work with quite a lot of talented people. So uh, in that sense, I was quite happy to be able to work with them. But uh, in my experience, at least, there were quite a. a there were quite a few characteristics that were common across all of them. And then if I am to just uh, structure it in, uh, in different dimensions, like the first one was about mathematics. So uh, basically we are dealing with statistical informations and then having a grasp of it always helps. And I'm also biased towards that because I'm a mathematician. But uh, uh, secondly, the, the other one, and these are all equally important. Huh? So uh, the second one is about business know-how. So, because basically when you build a model, if that model is not generating value and uh, if the people building it doesn't recognize the value in it, it also just brings it to uh, quite a halt. So that's why actually knowing what you, uh, knowing a little bit more about what business you're in is also quite uh, important. And finally, I mean, machine learning is, uh, is done by a code. So having a coding skills, hacking skills is already quite essential uh, to begin with. So uh, for me, uh, those three dimensions, mathematics and business know-how, as well as the hacking skills are the quite essential uh, traits to have. Perfect, thanks. I guess that I still have to uh, work on some of those before I can be a real data scientist. Um, but therefore, uh, moving to, uh, to someone else who has more expertise in that, um, I guess, Maud, it's, it's, uh, it's time for the second mini lecture. Uh, so I'd like to give the floor again to you, um, you to present some of the applications that uh, AI and ML can, uh, can bring. Great, thanks. Um, so thank you. Well, we've already seen some applications and, and I guess we've already also um, highlighted, even in this short discussion, that despite the fact that I gave this 
pretty much like bird's eye view of how machines learn, there's a lot of challenges that need to be covered to actually bring this to practice. So a bunch of the engineering challenges were just highlighted. If you're recognizing these spam messages at these gigantic scales, um, but there's more challenges there. And, and by the time you move into the actual applications, I think this is where in some ways you find some of these interesting hard problems um, that, are, that need solving and are still open. So what I'm going to try to do if, is give you two different application areas, but predominantly also highlight some of what I think are still pressing problems in this field, in the usage of AI in general. So I'm going to talk about two applications, each for a few minutes, and try to highlight why I think they're, they're important. There are also two applications where uh, I would say KPN is actively involved in. So uh, some of the work that I'm presenting here is also partly in collaboration with KPN. And one of the first projects which I find extremely interesting is this project on what's called churn modeling. So I hope everyone is aware of this term churn, but it's basically the idea that people might cancel their subscription. And if we model churn, what we want to know is in, in effect, we want to know when people cancel their subscription, who is canceling their subscription, why is this happening? So we're kind of trying to, in some ways, predict, given all the background characteristic of a specific customer, whether or not he or she is likely to cancel their subscription. So in a sense, this is a supervised learning problem. Eh? We have background characteristics of the person, and on the other hand, we have the outcome. However, so this data, despite the fact that it seems simple enough, if you have, for example, hundreds of thousands of cases of examples of customers, maybe all of the marketing interventions they have seen, and you have their actual outcome measure, then you could train a computer the way that I've tried to describe in my previous talk to actually link the two together and to say, oh, this customer is likely to churn. Well, one of the things that's somewhat tricky in this is that there's one additional step above this supervised learning that we're actually trying to achieve in these kind of projects. Because we're on one hand trying to link the characteristics of this customer, uh, his or her, purchase behavior, maybe mobile phone behavior, to whatever is going to happen in the future. But somewhat more than this, we're often interested in, are there ways in which we can maybe make changes to this? And, and in effect, could we, for example, send new offers to this customer that actually are things that the customer would like that would change the course of his or her churn over history? And here is where, in some ways, we step beyond the supervised learning problem to a much more tricky problem, because now we're trying to not just link input and output, but we're trying to say something about the response in the future when we make some kind of change. So if we send a new message to people, how does that change their churn? And this is one of what I would say, one of the core challenges pressing the AI field right now, um, which is broadly kind of known under this heading of causality, because basically, Suppose that we have two different marketing campaigns, two different actions. I'm just calling them A and B here on this slide. And we have some, some measure of how likely it is that, that the customer would stay. This is this Y, whatever this outcome measure would be. But we have some, some difference between these different people. Some have seen B, A, some have seen B. And we're trying to learn what their outcome is. But actually, we're not just trying to link the input, the action, to the output. But in reality, we're trying to do something like this. We're trying to know what would have happened to a specific customer if we would have changed the message that we're sending them. What is going to happen if we send a new product offer to people? So now we're trying to say something about what would happen for an individual person if we do something else. But one of the fundamental problems there is that we've never actually seen this happen because we've never actually done something else for these people. And this is an extremely fundamental problem because it's a problem you don't only find in churn modeling, but it's a problem you also find when you start thinking about administering medical treatments to people. Here we want to know the effect of the treatment, and in some ways we want to learn it based on the data that we have, but we only have data about the treatments that we selected. We don't have data about what would have happened if we had done something else. And in some ways, even on top of this, the churn problem, which I think is why it's a very interesting problem theoretically, 
is even more involved because there's new customers all the time and there's new campaigns all the time and there's new products and new preferences all the time. So it's also not just supervised learning, it's learning causal effects in a constantly changing operation. This is one of the applications where a lot of web companies are involved, companies like KPN are involved, but they're tr really trying to dig out some of these questions that are immediately also relevant, for example, for healthcare. Another application area which I see and which is very, very much growing at the moment is what I'm calling edge AI. It's this simple idea that once we've learned some kind of AI model, so once we've learned some relationship between input and output, for example, once we're able to recognize where people are in a picture, well, we might actually want to think about when are we doing this and where are we doing this. So it gives you some examples. Um, we might want to blur faces of people before we send them to some company, to some server. Um, if I go back to the cows that I introduced in the beginning, we might actually want to analyze their behavior, not going to in the cloud, but maybe on the farm where there's no internet connectivity. So at some point, now that we are all starting to make these useful AI models, we have to start thinking about how do we use them in practice and where do we use them in practice. And in my view, we're moving more and more towards this idea that after a model has been trained, again, for which you need loads and loads of data and very big computers, we can then decide where to actually use this model. And often it will be useful to, if you think about all the devices that we're interacting with and the cloud that's on one end and the actual cameras or the actual devices around the necks of these cows. Then there's all kinds of devices in between and it's often very useful to move a lot of this AI as much as possible to what's called the edge, to the outside of this graph. Why? Because it's faster, you save energy by doing things actually over there and not sending all the data around and there's more privacy guarantees because a lot of the data doesn't actually leave the location. So I think this idea of moving AI to the edge is extremely powerful and kind of growing at the moment. It's a really useful application. And one of the things we've recently done together with KPN, KPN, with KPN Things, which is their IoT platform, is effectively do the following. So we, we trained an AI system to on a very small device like this be able to recognize the emotional state of people. So we have an extremely small camera. It's only a few dollars to actually buy such a board. And this would recognize faces. And what we're doing here, and this is in part what we're trying to do with Scalable, trying to make it very easy to actually move such a trained model to a device. Connecting this with some of the services that KPN is providing with their IoT network and the LoRa network, we can now have these extremely small devices do very complex jobs without any involvement of a server, and we're only sending back the actual results. So we get to things like this, where we have very small devices. Again, like if you're looking at the hand on the background, this is how big they can be. Those are analyzing all the people in a room and seeing their emotional state and sending those extremely efficiently through LoRa to a central server without actually sharing all the actual images. And I think this is an extremely interesting example of where now that we know how to build some of these AI models, we can start thinking about where we can use them most effectively. Thanks again, Mauritz, for your interesting talk. Uh, I have to say I'm always impressed about the different applications that AI and ML bring. Um, before we go to the next questions, I believe that there is also a question from someone at home. Uh, so MJ, yep. um, can you please share that one? Yeah, it's a question from Richie uh, van Heuven. And uh, they give you all a compliment, uh, guys, on the table. Uh, you got some great data and um, machine learning experts at the table with some awesome track record professionally. So that's your compliment, and I think he's right. I'm interested in knowing what machine learning models do you train for fun outside your formal role? Anyone? Anything on that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris? Sure, I'll, sure, I'll take it. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I'm a practitioner, so I go for the most complex possible, uh, general AI. So um, how can I get a machine learning application to interpret the world and have an opinion as to what's going on? So the, essentially consciousness. Um, so I have my own take on this and I design my own algorithm to try and pull this off. So it's a, 
multi-time series analysis pattern recognition engine. So this is the kind of stuff that I spend my weekends on, trying to figure out how to get a machine to have an opinion about what's going on in the world. So uh, the cool stuff about this is that uh, nobody's done it before, so uh, nobody can tell me I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me, actually. So actually, for you also, it, it never stops. Like, whether it's work, whether it's the evening, or whether it's weekend, you always... Um, if, if I can carve some time out of, um, where I, I'm not needed with my family, yes. <laughs> uh, then I spend uh, programming. Cool. Um, and I believe that there is another question. The Google, the Google guy. Oh, sorry. Um, maybe indeed a uh, Turan. Um, yeah, uh, so um, uh, at Google we have this uh, possibility of working on 20% projects and then uh, the one that I am hoping to start soon is, uh, is about asteroid detection from telescope images. So basically what you have is that uh, the telescopes just generate tremendous amounts of image data and then basically the scientist wants to know where the asteroids are and then basically just picking them out of those large, large, large images is sometimes very difficult. And then uh, we are, I'm planning to start a project uh, with a few colleagues of mine here at Google uh, to work on that. Cool. Quite an interesting one. Sounds nice, thanks. Um, all right, so I also want to focus a bit more on the future. Um, and Maudis was mentioning, of course, that uh, we are developing our techniques, the models, but data is also an important part of that. And um, I'm actually actually curious um, if m maybe uh, Chris, uh, if you can answer, uh, do you believe um, that the, the the technique, if you look at the future, that the technique will improve significantly, um, or that you will foresee for the future that actually the improvements will be more in uh, in terms of data? Okay, so th okay, this is uh, at least in the f my field, it's a bit of controversial. Um, I think that we might have hit a plateau as far as a ML techniques, so deep neural networks, backprop, that kind of stuff, where a lot of the value and efforts have been, that are actually paying off right now are in feature engineering. So creating the, the essentially, um, yeah, the making better grain, finely grained data, transforming it into more useful features. That's right now where most of the effort, uh, efforts has been put into because there's not much space where we're thinking that we can actually improve the techniques that we use. All right. So it's controversial because uh, there are a few techniques on the road that have some potential. Uh, uh, heck, using uh, saw, um, wetware, uh, using biological systems as computation um, engines. Who knows, it might pay off. Uh, but at least right now, I think we might have hit a plateau on the technique and are more focusing on feature engineering. Yeah, all right. So, of course, it's, it's always important to have the right input. You can have the model, but input is, of course, also very important. Um, so, uh, Joni, actually, for you, um, what kind of changes do you foresee for the future if you look at your own field? So, academic world and, of course, um, the startup world. Yeah, so um, what, what I see is that, 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 um, that, that innovation uh, will be coming from 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 startups. So I, I think um, the biggest competitor for corporates right now are the VCs, um, because they the the interest rates are so low. VCs are pumping money into uh, the startup world, and that's where the where the innovation is uh, is coming from. And that's why I think it's it's super important um, uh, for the Netherlands or for any country to um, to go into that uh, innovative space um, and uh, also. Uh, utilize the, the universities there. There's a lot of technology, a lot of uh, experience, a lot of knowledge, and see how we can translate that uh, yeah, knowledge into uh, applications that we can really use. Um, and I think, you know, well, <laughs> working at Jazz, I think Jazz is a very good example where we try to combine, you know, for example, with the playground, with the incubator, where we try to combine the academic world with the startup world. And I think that's, you know, a, a uh, development that, you know, is already starting and will continue. So uh, actually, uh, it's important for the corporates who are uh, speed dating in a, in a few minutes from now uh, that they really uh, have some good sessions and make some good connections because you will say that's the future. Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of investments, actually, Turan, um, I'm interested w how you would see the, the investment landscape in the upcoming years. I mean, uh, the investment landscape is 
Yes, I, I agree that the venture capitalists are sitting on a, a pile of cash in an interest rate, uh, uh, low interest rate environment, and there will be quite a lot of money will be poured into the startups. But at the same time, I also believe that there is also, um, uh, there's, the startups should be also careful about basically how to position themselves, because I'm also quite seeing quite, myself seeing quite a lot of startups, just the positioning them as the AI startup of the future, whereas they're just like a positioning uh, their efforts uh, too much, if I may. So for example, they're just uh, like, if, to put it simply, they're just trying to kill a, a mosquito with a shotgun. So that's why actually one thing that I can encourage is startups is to position themselves because the future holds in the applications of the AI. And then uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the best algorithm will win overall. But then basically, uh, I would recommend the startups to look into smart applications of AI rather than trying to solve every single problem out there with AI. It's actually an interesting topic that you covered there, because um, like I mentioned before, we have online networking rooms, and actually this is one of the topics. So if uh, people are um, uh, believe at home that they uh, have some experience with this, some insights, please feel free after this event to, uh, to go to these rooms and to uh, continue this conversation. Um, but to move forward over here, of course, uh, Maudits also mentioned something about AI on the edge. Uh, within KPN, of course, Chris, um, this is a very important topic. Uh, so we just launched our 5G network, and that's like a, a, a large in innovation uh, that we are working on right now. Um, what do you see for the future that Emma on AI could play um, in delivering, uh, in, in actually on our network? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is the thing. So essentially, you here we're a facilitator. We, we um, provide the underlying technology to allow applications that use AI to function better because it allows connectivity and higher speeds with 5G. Um, I mean, you can go crazy with this. You can do um, um, what we call immersive AI, uh, immersive um, VR, where you can see the outside but also has an overlay of something that's generated by the computer. And tracking this and actually generating it in real time it usually relies on some AI techniques. Uh, but you also have the, some of the similar cases like what he was uh, talking about, whether you have edge AI on cows or edge AI on your car uh, that uh, needs to communicate with home base or at least needs to get certain data that's simply not there at that moment. And 5G is the perfect facilitator for that because we allow for massive amount of bandwidth going into devices that could never be done with a cable, could never be connected with a cable. So, uh, hopefully, uh, we still play a big role in the, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> That's, uh, we're better I hope it. so as well, of course. Um, and then uh, I believe we also have another question from someone at home. So MJ? Yeah, a question from Jeff Stone. Uh, it's about a technology that I don't, uh, don't know much about. But uh, what's the opinion uh, for you uh, as experts on the future of graph database technology? <laughs> Why is everyone looking at me? <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 Maurits, are you... Uh... Well, the, whichever you prefer. Um, no, so for me, uh, the, the future of graph database technology, I mean, as for all database systems, they have their uses, I would say. Um, and what you pick is the right tool for the job. Um, and I think there, there are more and more jobs for which graph databases might indeed be the, the right tool. I don't think, and I, I guess this is true for all of these kind of new kind of technologies, I don't think they will solve everything, um, which often is how we pitch new technologies. And then, you know, a few years later, we find out that they solve specific problems, and that's what you should use them for. So that would be my take on, on graph databases. An issue from Chris, maybe? Sure, uh, uh, I agree. <laughs> I, I definitely, definitely agree. Um, uh, one of, at least one of the spaces that we have found that they excel in is um, allowing people to do explorative search. So where um, you might be able to s pinpoint a starting point for them, like uh, let's say a particular topic that we are worried that might too many people are calling about in the call center, and allow them to follow where this might lead them. So think of um, this, this game you can play with Wikipedia, where you can keep following hyperlinks and keep diving deeper and deeper into different topics. This is a, uh, graph databases are perfect for this because it allows you to follow particular, top, uh, particular nodes into other nodes which have more information and it's easier for human beings to process information that way. And this is unique to graph databases that this allows, it works well. 
All right, thanks. Um, looking at the time, we have to wrap up. So this was the last question for our panel discussion. Uh, and of course, uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, for being here today, for your information, for your informative talks, for your thoughts, for your experience in, uh, uh, that, you, that you shared. Uh, and of course, after, uh, after this event, I will uh, have some small gift for you. Uh, Turang, for you, it's, uh, it's on its way to your home. Uh, so uh, enjoy it for sure, uh, and thanks a lot. Um, all right, then. Then we move on to the second part of this event. Uh, mentioned at the beginning, of course, connecting is very important and one of the largest goals within this event. Uh, so therefore, in, uh, in a few minutes from now, 10 minutes, uh, we will move towards the speed dates. And to help you, to remind you again, uh, we will start the speed dates at four o'clock. Um, we have five different rounds of 20 minutes each. Uh, there's five minutes in between. Use that time to prepare yourself to get some rest, because otherwise two hours of speed dates is quite intense. Um, and just some small tips to help you. Uh, looking at the structure, of course make it personal, so start with a short round of introductions, but really keep it short, because uh, 20 minutes is like really short in time. Um, after that, if you have a pitch deck or anything like that, use that to present your idea or solution and make sure that you still have some time left, around five minutes for discussion. Uh, and at the end, don't forget, of course, to also think about the next steps. So make sure you also have some time at the end to uh, speak to each other about that. And some tips, uh, please use your camera to make it more personal. And if you are in a room with more people, uh, make sure to mute your microphone uh, to prevent too much noise. And for the ones, uh, who are not having speed dates or who are between a number of speed dates, we have online networking rooms. Uh, you can find the link for these networking rooms in the Outlook calendar invite. Um, I would give you some information about how it works. We've created multiple rooms. You will enter the welcome room. There's also a short introduction video about how it all works. Uh, but from there, you can click through the menu to move to the other rooms. We have three discussion rooms. Uh, there's a topic stated in that room that can help you as a conversation starter. Um, if you don't want to use that, you can also go to the meet and connect rooms. There you can just um, see other people, uh, approach them, and, to s and speak to each other. Uh, and if you just want to watch some interesting movies, we also have three interesting TED Talks set up for you. Uh, so you can also lay back and just watch those movies. Um, yeah, some tips. Uh, so there is a link in the Outlook calendar invite. If it doesn't work, please uh, copy paste it in your web browser. Um, if you enter the online networking rooms, please make sure to uh, put in your name plus your company name. Um, and also, uh, it, it's very hard for me to read because <laughs> it's quite far away. Um, Look around in the different rooms, so do not stick too long in one room. And of course, uh, make sure to keep track of time, because we've scheduled your speed dates. The, the, the schedule is tight, so be aware of the time and don't, uh, don't be late for your speed dates. And of course, have fun. And then, um, yeah. Some contact details, so we will move to the speed dates. If anything happens, if you can't answer a meeting, um, if uh, uh, the people you have to meet will, with doesn't show up, uh, or if, just if anything happens, feel free to contact us. Um, both I and a few of my colleagues will make sure to help you with that. You can call us on these phone numbers, or you can email us at kpnscalebs at kpn.com. Um, Tain and Esther also helped me a lot with organizing this event, but of course they're not the only ones. So also a really big shout out to all of my colleagues who helped organize this event. Uh, we couldn't of course have done this without you, so thank you very much for that. And 
if after today, after this event, you're like, okay, that was quite interesting, I would like to uh, do this another time, um, we already scheduled the following startup, or actually scale up afternoon, it's from next time. Um, it's three months from now, June 17th, you will receive an email with more information about it, but make sure that if you like it, subscribe directly with the link in the email. Uh, yeah, and then the only thing there's left for me to say is uh, good luck with the speed dates uh, and of course enjoy it and thanks for being here today. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, Turn on. Oh, it looks like uh, the, the image already froze. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>